uh, this evening. Um, we, uh, if you notice uh, next to your name, um, you might see a microphone. You want to make sure that you have that on mute throughout the duration of the webinar uh, so that we don't have any feedback noise coming through. Um, and then also there's a chat feature. So if you have any questions for Dr. Straw throughout, you can type those in and I'll be able to relay that to him to make sure that your questions are answered. Um, if you have trouble hearing us, you can also indicate that in the chat feature and we'll speak up. Um, and lastly, I just want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded uh, and we will have it available um, on our website uh, within, I guess, a week or two. Um, so in case you ha have any questions or want to refer back, you can do that. So I'm going to give it to Dr. Straw and he's going to take it away. Thank you, Katie. It's good to be with you all this evening. And there's a lot of information here. Um, what I'll probably do is we'll hit some highlights on some things, but since I know most of you are um, growing winter squash, we're going to focus on things on spaghettis and acorns and butternuts and so forth. So we'll get started. Uh, the first few pictures I'm going to have here are going to be some examples of what's happened in recent seasons, and hopefully this isn't what happens with you. Um, <laughs> um, there's two, three main things that we're going to talk about. Is One is uh, lack of disease control, secondly is lack of weed control, and then no or inadequate irrigation. Um, this is an example of, of butternut vines where the diseases come in, and unfortunately uh, there's no vines left. And the squash is just about mature, so it's going to make it the, the size is off because we haven't had good disease control. Uh, the next one here is a really unfortunate disease we run into. It's known as plectosporium blight or microdochium blight. And this is unfortunately a disease of, um, that gets in some winter squash, like the kabokas. Uh, it's really bad in pumpkins. It gets in some summer squash. And what really makes this disease really difficult is there's not uh, a lot of organic options. Even conventionally, uh, you have to stay on a really tight spray schedule to control it. Uh, one thing we found through the years is this is a disease that we might say is a rotational issue. Um, if you follow squash with squash, you're going to see this disease worse. And we've seen this happen right here in southwest Virginia on more than one occasion where people don't rotate away from a cucurbit and then the second year, um, you have this disease really bad. So uh, again, disease control is important, and obviously we need to get on a preventive spray program, whether we're organic or conventional, to make sure we can control that. Weeds, um, you know, we have a, a, my joke is, you know, where's the squash? Well, unfortunately, um, they're in that jungle somewhere. Um, you know, and, and this grower really tried hard. They like plastic but they just didn't do anything to control the weeds in the middle. And so, you know, it, when it came time to harvest, there was essentially nothing there. And, and so we need, to, we need to do better than that. And so we're going to talk about ways tonight where we can do that. And here's some examples I mentioned about not enough or inadequate irrigation or no irrigation. You know, here's some, um, some zucchini, and you can see that there's some, some irrigation, I mean, some water issues there. Some of the fruits start to kind of get twisted, they're not pretty, they're not uniform, and so we're continuing to, to look at that, and, and of course, unfortunately, these were past needing a drink of water. So water can be very, very crucial, although where most of us live, we typically get plenty of water, but, you know, we don't always get enough, and so there's times that we just, we have to have irrigation. Um, there were bright spots, though, and here's an organic grower that does a really good job. They're, you can see their rows are spaced wide apart, probably about 10 or 12 feet. I'm guessing 10 feet centers. And the idea here is, is that they're, um, you know, they've planted their squash on plastic. They do a really good job keeping the middles mowed. I think another picture illustrates that better. Here the plants are a little bit taller and looking really nice. And again, in this case, they're keeping the middles mowed. They've got the equipment to handle, um, handle the, um, um, weeds and so um, you know it works well and then I know this picture doesn't show up as good but they just mowed and everything's kind of neat and pretty so yeah that 
inspirational picture. <laughs> that was the one, too. That made me think I could do that. And you can do that. Not when they want. <laughs> <laughs> but that was some of squash. So, so there's, yeah. So anyway, here's where the shooters have been mowed. And so uh, we have some feedback from the audience. <laughs> So this evening we're going to start talking a little bit about crop groupings because crop groupings are important because of the way the, the labels are written for a lot of the cucurbits. Because uh, sometimes you can spray things on cantaloupe and watermelon that you can't spray on cucumbers and pumpkins and squash. So we're going to discuss that a few minutes and then we'll get into pH and fertility, some varieties, plant spacing, irrigation, and then disease, insect, and weed control. So when you look at the way the crop groupings are represented. Basically, you have what's called the melon subgroup, which is cantaloupe and watermelon. And the representative crop is watermelon, I mean, it's cantaloupe or muskmelon in that situation. So whenever they go to do residue trials, they do it on a cantaloupe or muskmelon. Whereas the squash and cu cucumber subgroup is based on um, one cultivar of summer squash and one cultivar of cucumber. And that includes summer squash, cucumbers, uh, edible gourds, pumpkins, winter squash, etc. All those are included in that. So, and again, that's sometimes you'll see a product label for one group and not for the other. And usually it's just because in, in the old days people didn't do the residue right, and so they wouldn't do it for everything. But there are some fungicides, for instance, that you can spray on uh, cantaloupe and watermelon, but you can't spray it on cucumber or squash because it might cause some fruit damage. Um, secondly, I want to, next is soil testing, and obviously soil testing is the only accurate method of determining the amount of lime and fertilizer to apply. Even organically, we need to soil test because we don't want to put too much out there. We don't want to, um, we get, we waste money, and you know, if we get a salt buildup or too much fertilizer, we can damage roots and even kill plants. But on the other hand, we want to make sure we have enough fertility because if you don't have enough fertility, it reduces your yield and you get um, four, um, four yields and four quality. So typically when we soil sample, we use a, a sample tube or a spade and we collect from at least four to six inches in depth, take eight or ten collections around the field, avoid sampling areas that are extremely wet or irregular that you know are different, and then put those samples in a clean plastic container, mix them up good, and, and then send them off according to your state's recommendations. You know, Virginia has its way, Kentucky has their samples, West Virginia has theirs. So just whatever your local recommendations are. Typically we look at a pH of around 6.2, somewhere between 6 and 6.5. And I prefer soil sampling in the fall because if we need lime, it takes six months for ag lime to start to work. So if you're going to grow a crop there the next spring, if you put the lime out in the fall, that gets you started so that you get, um, the lime will start to work. And the reason we choose that six to six and a half is like this chart illustrates that you get a, a, a good availability of most nutrients between six and six and a half. There's a few that's a little less available, a few that are a little more, and so that's kind of why we choose. That's kind of a happy medium for most of our vegetables. Again, six to six and a half. Um, the thing though, when we get under 5.8, we start to run into things like magnesium and lithium deficiency and potentially manganese toxicity. Magnesium and molybdenum. Molybdenum. Yeah. <laughs> it's molybdenum. <laughs> well, so that's what it is. It's molybdenum. And then when we get pHs over six and a half, then things like copper and zinc and manganese, micronutrients really become unavailable and get tied up. Now, this is an example of magnesium deficiency. And the picture on the left, you know, when you see it at that point, it's not hurt you yet. If you'll um, apply magnesium or Epsom salts, you'll slop it at that. You won't ever green those leaves back up and no more leaves will get worse. Um, you know, the, you'll stop that from happening. Um, the one on the top right, you're starting to get into pretty critical stage. You're going to start losing yield. And by when it starts skeletonizing, like in the bottom corner down there, you've already lost production. So. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy it in a 50 pound bag. Epsom salts comes in 50 pounds. There's also uh, liquid forms of magnesium now. Unfortunately, I doubt most of those are already certified. 
So you'd use stick with Epsom salts to be the primary thing you'd want to stay with. Um, manganese toxicity happens also, and it's kind of a, the same thing. Um, in this case, you end up basically creating a magnesium deficiency because you have a lot of manganese available in the soil, and because you've made it available with a low pH. And again, adding Epsom salts in this situation, two to four pounds an acre or two to four tablespoons per gallon will help take care of that. Molybdenum, we don't see this one very often. I've seen it a few times in, in like mountain soils, more kind of, um, I would say, weak soils, soils that aren't real fertile. Um, and again, it's pH dependent when the pH gets too low. And so yeah, you can add something like ammonium molybdate or sodium molybdate. Uh, what it, usually sodium molybdate is the most affordable. Or you can use something like uh, a fertilizer that has micronutrients. Um, on fertility, for years and years, we've always recommended that cucurbits need about 45 to 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre. We would put 30 or 40 pounds out at planting, and then another 15 to 30 pounds at 12-inch runner development. Uh, phosphate, low 90 pounds, medium 45. Potash, a low test, you'd use 60 pounds on a medium test, 30. Um, and this still works for probably summer squash on bare ground or pumpkins on bare ground, although even on pumpkins and winter squash now, we're probably pushing this up closer to 100 pounds on nitrogen and a little higher than that on the, on the P and the K. Um, so basically on a, boy, a bare soil test, you know, something like 50-50-50 at planting would be a possibility. And then, um, or 10 to 12 pounds per thousand square feet uh, of 10-10-10. And then when you start to get to that 12-inch runner development, you put another 100 pounds of ammonium nitrate or 200 pounds of calcium nitrate or probably about uh, 150 pounds of bulldog soda or whatever you're going to use if you're organic for a, for a side dress nitrogen. Now granted if you're using uh, chicken litter or especially the pelletized chicken litter um, it's going to release over time so if you put a good dose of compost or chicken litter out there pre-season you know, it's going to continually break down and become available over the season. So you may not need as much fertility if you're doing that as far as side dressing. I when we go to plastic, plastic and, yes. Um, just say you're, you're building your soils up and you're organic and, um, you know, you get your soil test back and you're really low on, on P205. And usually I would throw out some 18460, build the P205 up, but you're trying to go organic. How would you build that phosphorus level up? What's the best way, the most economically efficient way to build that phosphorus level up organically? Probably the most efficient way would be to use um, um, rock phosphate and put it out in the fall before you're ready to plant. Even rock phosphate, though, takes a while. There is a product that we're, I'm not sure if it's on recertified yet. We're trying to find out right now. I think it possibly is. It's called Tennessee Red Phosphorus. It's mined in um, middle or kind of Middle Eastern uh, or Middle, yeah, Middle Eastern Tennessee, um, and it is being used in organic production. So I'm assuming that it probably is Omri or is going to be Omri certified. And the thing that's nice about that product is that it is Omri certified, or I mean that it looks like it's going to be, and it's available quicker. Now there are some soft phosphates but most of the soft phosphates have been treated with something to make them more available and break down mm -hmm. quicker, and most of those are not OMRI certified. Now, you know, if you're organic, but you're not OMRI certified, you know, and you're not certified organic, then some of those soft, rock, soft phosphates might work, but if you're going to be certified organic, you have to stay with the OMRI certified or at least some, whatever your certifier is going to approve. So my recommendation is, is if you put out either the Tennessee red phosphate if it's approved by your certifier or rock phosphate in the fall before you, you know, plant the next spring. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh-huh. So when we go to plastic and drip, a lot of times we find that the amount of fertility is higher because we take the water out as a limiting factor. So we'll add um, maybe more nitrogen or may and quite a bit more phosphorus and potassium because water is now not the limiting factor. Now nutrition is if we give it what it needs. So you can see here that we may start out at the 50 pounds, 
but we may put another 100 pounds through the drift. Now, summer squash, I wouldn't. Pumpkins and winter squash, I probably wouldn't go that high. But like cantaloupe, watermelon, cucumbers, I might put more fertility out there. So, um, so this is just an example. Conventionally, we put out, say, something like 5,100, 100 at planting. And then, you know, two or three weeks, four weeks after we plant, we'd start feeding them through the drift. And again, if you've used a, mold, a, a compost or a, um, some sort of pelletized litter or something like that, um, you know, you're going to get a breakdown and you probably aren't going to side dress as much, but you still may need to. And, and I guess at this point would be a good time just to go ahead and clarify. One of the weaknesses, and I'm glad you asked the question about the phosphorus, one of the big weaknesses that happens is people um, in, in organic don't build the soil prior to starting. And so, you know, for two or three years, we need to be building the fertility up. And then if you don't, when you, if you just start out with a pasture field or uh, old field that's been kind of left to grow up, yeah, you've got some fertility there, but you haven't built it up. So about halfway through the season, a lot of times, crop starts to run out of gas and it's expensive to add nutrients at that point. Um, again, fertility organically, and this has been one of the, I guess I got ahead of myself a slide. I should have looked up on the screen. <laughs> Limiting factors in organic production is poor soil fertility. Again, my recommendation is start two, three, four years ahead of time and don't rely on foliar sprays and drip applications alone. They're very expensive. Um, and unfortunately, most of the stuff that's OMRI certified is very, very expensive. Um, you know, there's some things that are approved by NOP that may not be OMRI certified, but you don't know. You've got to check to see if your certifying agent allows that product to be used. So again, what do we do to build fertility? We add cover crop. We use cover crops. We can use green manure crops. We can add legumes. Apply our manure and compost. And uh, at least 90 days. I'd still like to see 120 because most of this fruit laying on the ground. So it's probably good to be 120 days. Typically on vegetables, I try not to go over four tons per acre. Um, if it's a high demand crop, you might go as high as six, but for most everything you're doing, except for maybe cucumbers, I would probably do stay around four tons. Uh, and then you could, of course, drip or side dress. And side dress is a little bit harder, you, again, because you're limited on what products you can use. Uh, most of them are fish emulsions, um, and so, you know, just be careful with that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they're expensive and, and it takes a lot to do it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then foliar products, you know, you do have um, some foliar fertilization that you can do. But remember that generally on micro, our macronutrients are very low in concentration. So it takes quite a bit to get much of a response out of a foliar fertilizer. Um, on the next slide, just an example of what nitrogen deficiency looks like in cucumbers. Um, here's potassium deficiency in cucumbers, and you see the marginal leaves, uh, I mean the leaf margin yellowing. Uh, this is calcium deficiency, just like you see in tomatoes. It's called blossom end rod, and it gets in winter squash, and on watermelons, probably the two worst cucurbits. Um, let's talk a little bit about varieties now. And basically, um, on cucumbers, there's a lot of things out there. Um, I mean, if you look in seed catalogs, there's lots of varieties. Um, through the years, a lot of growers have used Cobra. Uh, I will point out um, two particularly. One is Bristol. Uh, Bristol is a new one that has true downy mildew resistance. All the old varieties used to have downy mildew, but there's a new strain of downy mildew that was able to build resistance to all, pretty much all the resistance that was in, bred into these plants. So Bristol is one that actually has downy mildew resistance again. And then Diamondback is a new one that's kind of an improved cobra. So those would be two that I would look at if I were wanting to grow the uh, cucurbits, or cucumbers, I'm sorry. Uh, Picklin types, uh, we rely a lot on things like Supremo and Zapata and Max Pack. They have good disease packages. Uh, I mentioned Eureka here because it's another pickle, and it's actually a unique pickle in that you can harvest it as a pickle, but if it starts to get bigger on you, it doesn't get really fat. It stays more cylinder, smaller and, and gets longer. And I actually have people who sell them as slicers, as small slicers. So I call it a kind of a dual purpose type. And then, of course, you have the burpless type, like tasty green. And if you're going into high tunnels, 
or uh, greenhouses, we do a lot with uh, orthenocarpic types, and these are ones that do not need pollination. They just have female flowers that set fruit. And so uh, Lisboa is one, Excelsior, um, but you can get into all kinds of beta alpha types, the ones that come out of the Mediterranean. Uh, there are actually some really nice slicers now that look like true slicing cucumbers that are parthenocarpic. Only thing I'll, sh I'll warn you, you'll have sticker shock. Most of these seeds start around 25 cents a piece and go as high as 40 and 50 cents a piece. So, you know, you don't, it's not something that you take to the field. It's something that you lose and use in a greenhouse or in protected culture where you're going to get a lot of production out of it. Very expensive seed. So be careful. Must melon, not a lot of changes on the wholesale market. We use a lot of things like Aphrodite and Athena. You know, some people use Ambrosia's uh, hybrid, uh, Burpee hybrid, Hales Best, Superstars for local markets. Um, one I really like, um, it's a little bigger than a lot of markets want, but it's great for local sales called Avatar. Very large fruit, very good netting, very good flavor. It's earlier like the uh, uh, Aphrodite. Um, you know, we could probably make the size a little smaller if we tighten them up. But, you know, for local sales, a lot of times people like those big melons. And then there's a couple of new ones from Syngenta that we're going to look at this year, uh, Sound and Accolade. Um, so we'll be looking at those to see how they compare with Athena and Aphrodite. Uh, this is just a picture of the Athena, which, you know, is the eastern ship of cantaloupe. And here's the Aphrodite. Um, one thing about it, in cool, wet weather, we can run into problems with, you know, low light, cool temperatures, and then in response, we a lot of times get low soluble solids, and soluble solids is a measure of the sugar in the um, um, melon, uh, and then if it's low in sugar, it has poor flavor, and of course, if it's really wet, we can get cracky. Um, but for years, there's been a label for ProGib, which is I imagine it's OMRI certified too. It's just a combination of two, pro, uh, two gibberellic acids. And you can make three applications of four ounces per acre. You start about 21 to 28 days after transplanting, put it out every 10 to 14 days. I'm sure it's went up a little bit, but still 20 to $30 for all three applications per acre. And you can mix it with fungicides and insecticides, and it really increases your bricks. The next slide shows that um, untreated, this was where they sprayed part of the field, didn't spray part of the field, and then they used two different rates. And the untreated, none of the cantaloupes bricked over 10, and 10 is kind of that magical number where they can reject melons if they brick under 10. At two fluid ounces, three times, 75% of the melons bricked over 10, and at four fluid ounces, every melon bricked over 10. And I've actually seen this done another time where a grower sprayed, and honestly, we had a hard time ever finding a bad melon in the field. Every one of them tasted good. So I, I call it brick insurance for cantaloupe. Uh, another side effect is that when you spray it, if you look at this next slide, that the melon at the top did not have it sprayed. The middle and the melon had two ounces, and the middle of the melon on the bottom, four ounces. And you can see the flesh thickness is so much thicker. So the pro jib actually made the have you more flesh, so you had more cantaloupe to eat. Watermelons, honestly, right now the best seeded in an all-sweet type or seeded type with in the all-sweet rind pattern is Estrella. I mean, Sangria is okay, Jamboree is all right, but if, to me, Estrella is just, you know, it's the one I want to grow. It's been kind of hard to get seed over the last couple of years, but it should be pretty available this year. Um, for crimson sweet types, Top Gun is probably the most commonly grown. If you can't get the Top Gun, then we'd go with Anthem. Um, Anthem. And then for the sugar baby types, uh, Lantha and Jade Star are the two that we uh, that we generally grow. Uh, watermelon seedless. There are a lot of, of nice watermelon out there now. Um, Fascination is the most commonly grown seedless watermelon in the southeastern U.S., although it's kind of losing some ground to some of the newer ones, um, but still very popular. And you know, always remember if you do seedless melons. You know, you need to choose one that fits the size and the count that your buyer wants and that um, has a rind pattern that your buyer wants. And unfortunately today, a lot of chains want long seeded melons because that way when the person brings it to the counter with a seedless sticker on it, hopefully the piece of people checking them out realize, oh, that's a seeded melon, or vice versa. They put a seedless sticker 
on a, I mean, a seeded sticker on the seedless melon, and it's more round or oval, and you'll try to buy it cheaper. <laughs> so, um, not that people would really do that, but you know. Um, anyway, um, so kind of know the rind pattern, the shape, and the size that your buyer wants. There is a new series from uh, Seminus that's really caught on quick. Uh, it's getting a lot of the market. Uh, Syngenta pretty much has kind of had the seedless watermelon market of late, but Seminus has three or four new ones, Bottle Rocket, Joyride, Road Trip, and actually even another number besides this 258 that's on here. Um, they have some really nice melons coming, and they've really made a big inroad into uh, the seedless watermelon market in the last couple of years. And then there's still things interest in personal or palm melons. And these really were popular a few years ago. These are like the four to six pound, four to seven pound melons. The idea was that, you know, uh, a retired couple or a young family would buy one of these and take it home and eat it in a couple of settings and not have any waste. The problem was they priced these things so high, they priced them at like $4.99 a pound, I mean a melon. Chucks, you could buy a seedless watermelon for $3.99 and even in times $2.99. So, you know, it did, it did, they kind of ruined their market. They, they overpriced it. So they're still out there and there's, there's quite a bit of interest at times and other times nobody seems to have much. So, but there are, I still have some acquaintances who grow them. Probably, um, they're all good. I think for teeth. Petite Perfection is really good, uh, the last one there, and then there's uh, Ecstasy has been really good. It's been around for quite a while. Those are probably the two best ones, Ecstasy and Petite Perfection. Pumpkins, we, we have a lot of different pumpkins out there, and, and um, the ones we recommend generally are Aladdin, Apollo, Gladiator, Kratos, Magician, Magic Wand, Magic Lantern. And Warlock, although the seed on Warlock is fixing to get really hard to find, it's a hard shell variety that we use to set in the heat. And where most of us are from, that's probably something we don't need. For large fruited varieties, we're kind of hurting now. Um, I think there's going to be some new ones coming down the line, but Conestoga Giant has kind of played out. They came out with Conestoga Special, and it's not that good. Gold Medal's losing it, playing out over time. Early Giant, some people like Early Giant, some people hate it. I personally hate it, but um, it's one of those things that just, it doesn't always do well. And then the new one from Harris Moran, Aries, it's not really as big as I want, but now Harris Moran has some new stuff that's coming that's really nice. And there'll be a new one from uh, Cicada, if they get seed of it, uh, it looked really good this year called Hulk, like the Incredible Hulk. It was really good, but they don't have any seed of it. Okay. Oh, it's probably 30, 40 pounds with a stem, stem in it almost as big as your forearm. Uh, really nice um, pumpkin. So um, there's some neat stuff coming for small fruited stuff or pies, a lot of using cannonball, field trip, hybrid pan, mystic plus. Um, edible types, things like buckskin, small sugar for edibles. We'll talk about another pie in a minute that's actually considered edible. Whites, things like cotton candy, moonshine, lumina. Cinderella's, fairy tales, or rouge. Other specialties we see out there: gray goat, Queensland blue. Uh, there's markets for, and then kabocas. I know that's not a pumpkin, but it's kind of a squash type pumpkin, you know, cross. Uh, the red curry and the sunshine for the red or orange, and then cha cha or black forest for the greens. <laughs> so we do a lot of variety trials every year, and my, the variety trial really hasn't changed. The list of varieties is about the same. There's a couple of things on here, and Cronus is one we've looked at at higher elevations and spacing it out about 50 or 60 square feet. It's It does okay, but it, it's a specialty. It'll get 30, 40 pounds, and again, with a stem about as big around as your forearm, but it just doesn't yield consistently. And so there's, actually, I think it's going to be a product that's going to go away before long. Orange Rave is one we've started using where we have heat situations where it's hotter. Uh, it sets, it's about like a magic lantern with a little bit better disease package and a little better stem, but it sits well in the heat. Ray is another that's kind of a cousin to Cronus, space it out a little bit. And then I mentioned here for trial, there's a new one uh, from Enzo Zodden called Bellatrix. Uh, it's okay, it's nothing brand new or you know exciting, but it's, it's another Me Too pumpkin. Orange Sunrise is one I'm really excited about. 
Uh, it's a real short season, so if you get rained out or something happens to your crop, it gets destroyed, or, or it's real dry and you can't plant till, plant till late, it'll come in in about 75 days. And so, it, and it sets pretty well in the heat also. And then I mentioned earlier, Hulk was really nice this year, but there's just no seed of it available. They had a crop failure on the seed. And then a lot of Johnny stuff looks good. I will just say two things about it. Number one is, is they typically are a lot smaller down here than they are in their catalogs. Um, they don't get as much size. And sometimes the color isn't as good on them as they, as they would be if you grew them farther north. But I'm going to look for the next few minutes at just, I won't spend a lot of time. Here's Apollo, really nice, um, good handles, um, good stem, um, good powdery mildew package, and it sets fairly well in the heat. Aladdin's been around for a long time. Um, it's a beautiful pumpkin. Stems are a little bit small on it. Actually, Apollo has an improved Aladdin, has a better stem, and, and Aladdin only has powdery mildew resistance one parent, so it's not as strong on powdery. And it kind of sometimes gets that eggplant shape to it. You can see the one there on the left, it kind of a little bit funny shape, but it does yield well in the heat and it's been around for a long time. This is Gladiator, nice stem, powdery mildew, um, a powdery mildew resistance in both parents, excellent quality. It does really well in the mountains in the cool weather, but you take it to the heat, it doesn't always set well. Um, really, really a nice pumpkin. Uh, we use it a lot in the mountains. Uh, this is Magic Lantern. It's been an industry standard for years. Um, really a nice pumpkin. It makes a lot of fruit. A lot of the fruit, though, is a little small. And so most of the time, it'll make like five or 6,000 pumpkins an acre, but only about two or 3,000 of them is big enough to pick up. But, you know, it's still a nice pumpkin and still used. It does have powdery mildew in one parent only. Uh, this is Magic Wand, which a lot of people thought was going to replace Magic it's not quite as big consistently, and it has a very nice handle, but it does have um, it does have powdery mildew in both parents. Um, Magician, we've looked at this one for a long time. It kind of started out as like a school tour type pumpkin, and we got to finding out that it ranges in size from about 10 to 18 pounds, uh, depending on at what position the fruit sets and how much water you have and how tight you plant them and all those things. But this has excellent powdery mildew resistance, and it also has resistance to zucchini yellow mosaic virus. Here's the Cronus I mentioned a minute ago. Really nice, big pumpkin. Very classy with a nice stem. Just very inconsistent. Consider this a specialty, and this isn't something you're going to grow a lot of. Orange Rave I mentioned. I really am, like this pumpkin. I've always liked it in the heat, but recently we've started looking at it more in the mountainous regions. And it does well there too. So we're, we're kind of excited about growing more of these because it has a great powdery mildew package and nice stem. This is the Ray I mentioned, it's your cousin Euchronis. Not quite as classy a pumpkin, but it still has a nice big stem in it. And this is the Aries. This is a tall pumpkin with a big stem. And unfortunately, most of our tall, big, big pumpkins are tall. Things like Early Giant, Conestoga Giant, uh, when we used to grow Howden Biggie. Uh, Aries now. These are all big, tall pumpkins with big stems. Um, doesn't like the heat real well either, so we're still looking for the optimum new pumpkin that, you know, big, and I think it's coming. This is probably my new favorite pumpkin, Kratos. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than and, uh, than the Gladiator. Um, we grew several of them this year, and I was really happy with the size. Everything goes in the bin, essentially. Uh, powdery mildew in both parents, and it also has resistance to zucchini yellow mosaic virus. Uh, really a nice, classy looking pumpkin. It's one that I think industry is going to adapt more and more. This is Zeus. It's a cousin to Kratos. I don't like it as well. It doesn't have the zucchini yellow mosaic virus, and it's more variable in size. Um, this pumpkin's being used more in the Northeast for direct marketing. Uh, I just like the Kratos so much better than the Zeus. Uh, this is Orange Sunrise I mentioned a minute ago, and you can kind of tell the color's not quite as dark on this, and it's because it has the precocious yellow gene in it, which masks green from viruses. If you look in the picture there to the pumpkin on the right, you kind of see that little orange up on the stem, going up on the stem a little bit. That's trait of precocious yellow. So it means it's earlier. So this pumpkin is actually yellow to start with instead of green. 
and then as it begins to mature, it turns orange. So the more mature it gets, the oranger it gets. So, but it's got good powdery mildew, and it's really short season, but it sets well in the heat. Uh, there was a trial in North Carolina this year at an experiment station, and this was the only variety that set in the trial. Um, this is some new experimental stuff now that's coming, and you can see some really nice big fruit with big stems in it. I'm not going to belabor these, but 27, 16, I like 27, 19 is even nicer. Both of those Harris Moran's going forward with. Um, this is another one, huge stem you can see. Um, <laughs> very, very big stems on some of these. Um, now I'm getting over into the Johnny stuff, and again, I'm not going to belabor the point, like I say, Sometimes they're not as consistent. Sometimes the color's not quite as good, although the color in these were pretty good, but the size isn't where a lot of times the catalog describes them. There's Champion, New Racer Plus, Rival, Charisma, Racer, Cargo. And then here's some, another, some more experimental stuff from Harris Moran that's coming just to illustrate the size and the, and the size of the stems that they have. And I put a warlock in so you could see. You know, a lot of people didn't like it because it was hard shell and it was hard to carve and didn't have real pretty exterior appearance. For small varieties, um, we've um, field trip little giant. Little giant's one that's a little smaller. Uh, the pie market's actually some buyers now want more count in a bin. Instead of wanting 125 pumpkins in a bin, they want 180 pumpkins in a bin or 175. So Little Giant's one that helps with that. Cannonball is a bigger one. Hybrid Pan, Mystic Plus are bigger. Jack Spratt's another one that's like a three pound pie pumpkin. So if you need those higher counts for being the one we've looked at. And then Mischief, I really like Mischief. I've always liked that pumpkin, but I don't know what you do with it. It's a three to four pound hard shell. Um, so, you know, it's, you can't carve it very well. Um, my wife says they make great beverage containers. She cuts the lids out and makes Halloween drinks and puts them in them. Um, crunchkins are hard shell replacements for munchkin. Uh, new little one pound, beautiful little pumpkin, and I think I've got a picture of it in a minute called Moonglow. It's really nice. And then for trial, uh, I like Cinnamon Girl. It's a pie pumpkin from Johnny's. It's pretty dark orange, but it's also edible. So if you want an edible pie pumpkin to both sell for decoration and eating, Cinnamon Girl is one I'd recommend. Uh, Holler has a whole new series out. It's this bicolor type pumpkin, kind of an orange and, and yellow called, and the spark is the small one, flames a little bigger, and blaze is the biggest. Uh, then Jill B. Little is an improved Jack B. Little, and then Harris Moran has a new one that I'm really excited about. I don't know where we're going to go with it. It's like a field trip, but about two pounds bigger and has a little bigger stem in it, and I'll, I think I've got a picture of it, too. So here's field trip. This is a really classy pie pumpkin, but, you know, you're only going to get about... 100, 100 to 120 of these in a short band, 125 if they're a little on the small side. Um, this is the one I mentioned is a little bit bigger. You can see uh, it's a little bit kind of more round instead of square. And not that the previous one was square, but you know, this one's kind of more rounded, about two pounds bigger, but a nice stem. You can see kind of most of the stems kind of curly and very attractive. Uh, this is Little Giant. Again, this is a, like a three to four pound, really nice high pumpkin. Uh, Cannonball's been around a long time. It doesn't really have a hard shell gene, but it's very, very hard. So it's very hard to, to um, carve. Hybrid Pam was one from Cornell. It's been an industry standard for pies for years. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any disease package in it, uh, no powdery mildew. Uh, it's very susceptible to microdochium and or plexisporium and downy mildew. So a lot of people have went away from it. Um, but it is a very, very attractive, kind of been the one that set the standard. Uh, Mystic Plus was an early pie from Harris Moran, only has powdery mildew in one parent. Everything else we talked about till Hybrid Pam all has uh, resistance in both parents. So Jack Spratt, very good powdery mildew resistant, three pound, and you see very nice dark stems, really attractive pie pumpkin. Mischief, this is the hard shell one, it's got good powdery mildew in it. Iron Man is about a three pound, two to three pound hard shell. Great for painting, not much for carving. <laughs> this is Crunchkin, the hard shell. Um, oh, it's got a decent disease practice package, but it's really early season. So they tend to go down if you leave them in the field because the vines go away, they're so early. 
But the second thing is, is mice love them. They'll, they'll, because they're hard shell, they'll eat a hole in them and they make houses out of them. And so they'll go in there and eat the seed and then they make residence there. Um, this is Cinnamon Girl, the one I said that was edible, very attractive. Not as dark as, as you would think it would be. They actually say in the Northeast, it's almost red, it's so dark. Um, this is the improved version of Jack B. Little Jill. And there's the series, the Spark, Flame, and Blaze I mentioned. And, you know, the Spark's like a half a pound, Blaze is like one to two pounds, and then our Flame, I mean, and Blaze is like three or four pounds, something like that. And this is the Moon Glow I mentioned, very, very nice, little one pound orange pumpkin, does really well. These things will set seven and eight per plant, and, you know, marketable fruit per plant, maybe nine, really nice. Uh, this is another specialty one I really like called Little Orange Pond. And uh, kind of like, it's a kind of a hard shell, but you can see it's kind of a variegated, um, nice specialty thing. And again, Little Pumpkin on was the original one that was white with a little orange and green on it. Um, some other things out there, Fall Splendor. And then I'm getting into specialty things now. Here's Blue Bayou. This is the blessed blue pumpkin out there right now. Uh, well, there's also one called Blue Dog, but they're essentially the same pumpkin, just sold under two different names by different companies. But Blue Doll or Blue Bayou are by far the nicest blues. They will out yield Jardale two to three per, per one. So if a Jardale you get one fruit off of, you'll get two or three off of these. It, it's that much better. This is probably my favorite pink one right now called Blush. Uh, it's from um, Clifton. A really a nice pumpkin, uh, good shape. Doesn't always yield the most, but much pinker than what you get with something like uh, porcelain doll. Porcelain doll, most of them are gray or white pink. Um, I'm not really high on this one, but this is an earlier blue, but you can see it kind of goes to a grayish white, and it also has a tendency to crack around the top. Another uh, pink that um, Clifton has is called Harvest Moon. It almost looks like a triangle shape, but excellent size. Um, a little flatter and, than the, than the um, blush, but very pink and very attractive. Uh, I'm not really high on Butterkin. Butterkin was one of those things that Seagway came out with that was going to be this specialty thing. It's very good eating quality, but where do you sell a cross between a butternut and a, I mean a, yeah, a butternut and a buckskin pumpkin? I haven't quite figured that out yet. The shape's not consistent. You can see there's long ones and round ones and but it is a good, it probably go good in processing. Uh, this is a last pink one that Clifton has. Again, I really like it. It's a little more round, called Moonstone. So they have the three blush, Harvest Moon, and Moonstone that are all really nice pink, and, and if you want pink pumpkins. Uh, when you get into things with like the Warty pumpkins, the Warty Goblin, a uh, really nice pumpkin, good green color on the warts. It really accents nice, probably the nicest 40 one. And here's a new experimental that's coming. Um, I don't know what they're going to name it, but it should be coming in another year or two. It's kind of a flat 40. Um, so and these are way off coming, but this is a white 40 pumpkin. Uh, it's actually a cream color, but it's supposed to be white. And here's another small 40 one that's coming. So there's some interesting things. Uh, here's what Marina, uh, Marina di Gioggia, I we call this gray matter looks more like brain tissue than it does a pumpkin. And then Grey Ghost, there's some, this is actually a processing squash out of New Zealand, and there's some interest in it. Whites, um, large, we do a lot of new moons and polar bears, mediums, cotton candies, moonshine, lumina, and I have on here for trial Blanco, and then smalls like two pounds, Snowball works really well, and then for the one pound miniatures, Poca Blanca and Casparita. Here's Poca Blanca. Coca Blanca and Casparita are both one pound, essentially the same pumpkin. They came from the same breeder, just two companies named it different things. So if you buy Casparita or Coca Blanca, you're going to get the same thing. There's a picture of them. You can't differentiate them. Um, Snowball, like I say, is about two pounds. Comes from uh, hybrid seed out of New Zealand. Really nice. Sometimes the stems want to pop out when they get a certain stage of maturity but really nice two to three pound. These have pure white gene as do the Casparita and Blanco, um, so they don't turn yellow, which is really nice. Lumina is of course a winter squash, been around for a while. The only problem with Lumina is one is it's not truly a pumpkin, and number two, 
it has a tendency to throw some blue and gray at times. So it'll, it'll be white, but it'll have some blue casts and some gray casts in it. So it doesn't sell good always for a white. Cotton candy has been the industry standard on the bigger whites. Unfortunately, it tends to yellow as time goes on. Um, moonshine is, when it came out, we were so excited about it because it was a little bigger, nicer stems, really nice color. Problem is it yellows really bad. And that can happen in the field, not to mention what it does once you pick it. It sits out in the sun for a week and it'll turn really yellow. This was the one we were really excited about was going to replace the Blanco. This is what it looked like the first year. It has a pure white gene in it, so it doesn't yellow as bad. And um, as it matures, you can see a really nice stem. But you can see here, these stems were really beautiful. They kind of twisted and kind of variegated, really attractive. Then the second year we grew it, it looked like this. A lot more variability in it, but still okay. The only problem was we planted about 3,000 of them, and out of the 3,000, we only got to harvest half of them because the stems popped out of half of them. And so, not a good thing when you're selling pumpkins to bring stems out. So, unfortunately, last year the seed they shipped was actually a white acorn squash. It was not this pumpkin. <laughs> so, um, we're interested to see what we get this year. It was a white acorn squash. It's when you grew it, it's what it produced was a white acorn squash. No, well, no, man, they, they realized it before anybody planted it. But they had started shipping a little seed and they realized there was a problem with it. So they stopped shipment and they and they tried to and they've got new new planting in now. Um, this is one called White Knight. There's lots of white flat white white ones in South Africa. The one we use grow the most commonly is called flat white boarboard. Black uh, flat by flat white board board. I'll get it out in a minute. We have other nicknames for it. I can get confused. But there's all kinds of these. Um, this is a, supposed to be an improved one called White Knight. And it was really nice. It was a little bigger and more consistent in size, but it also had a tendency to crack around the top. So one we weren't excited about. When you get into the big white ones, there's two that we really like. This is one called Polar Bear. Polar Bear is from Johnny's. It's, it'll range about 50 pounds. Really nice size and, and really nice pumpkin. And then New Moon. And there, you'll also find one called Full Moon. I try to stay away from full moon because it tends to yellow and doesn't have that pretty white color. Whereas the, the new moon and the um, polar bear stay pretty white. So that's all on pumpkins. We move over into summer squash. Um, there's a lot of varieties out there. It's crook neck and um, of course uh, prelude two is a GMO, but it's probably got the best disease package. But you know, there's other things, probably pick and pick. If you can tolerate a yellow stem, does really good early in the season. It produces a lot of yield, and uh, it does have the precocious yellow gene, so it masks the virus. Um, for straight necks, again, several different things. Probably cougar and lioness. Lioness has, to me, the nicest disease package. Um, doesn't always yield the best, but I also have some friends that grow it that they don't claim phytophthora tolerance, but they feel like they get a little bit better phytophthora tolerance out of the Lioness. And again, if you go into uh, varieties that yield really nice early, things like multi-pick and super-pick yield really well early in the season. Um, zucchinis, you know, I know it doesn't take a lot of zucchinis to feed the whole neighborhood, but, you know, there are a lot of zucchini varieties out there. Uh, Green Machine is probably the nicest one right now from Enza. The nice thing about Green Machine is, is that it does, again, they're not going to claim phytophthora tolerance, but it tends to Stand by top a little better than a lot of other varieties. And then our next two choices would be something like Respect and Dunja, do really good in our part of the world. Um, for yellow zucchinis, uh, probably my favorite right now is Golden Glory, uh, has a good disease package. Also, if I'm not mistaken, that's a, it's a parthenocarpic variety, so it tends to produce, uh, it'll produce fruit without being pollinated. So it's one to look at. Um, also, I didn't put it in here, but there are some parthenocarpic green zucchinis now coming out of England, and um, so you can grow them in high tunnels and greenhouses and get fruit to set without bees, but you don't have to have pollination. Uh, the one that's probably the best one right now is called Parthenon, and it's available from Johnny's. It's spelled like Parthenon, but it don't have an H in it. Parthenon. And then I said Golden Glory is also 
uh, parthenic carpet sets well without pollination. So moving over into probably what a lot of you all are interested in, and we spend a lot of time on varieties getting to here, is winter squash. And you know, autumn delight is my favorite acorn. It's the most consistent size. It's very uniform. The color is always dark green on it. If you're packing, it's really nice. Uh, you know, Table Queen's nice, Taybell PM. I would not grow Taybell because it doesn't have powdery mildew resistance. Whereas Autumn Delight, Taybell PM both have powdery mildew tolerance. Uh, Celebration, of course, is an acre type squash, but it has a different color pattern. It has the yellow on it and the white on it, which is not bad. It just, you know, it's a, not what you're going to go into in standard acre markets. So Autumn Delight's the one we use most often. Butternuts, is really an interesting category because there are a lot of them. Uh, there's a fellow a graduate student in North Carolina State now that's doing a lot of research, and you can find butternuts from a little over a pound up to like six or eight pounds. Um, and the market right now thinks it wants a three to four pound eight uh, butternut, but we're finding that a lot of people would rather have one a little smaller. But right now the market is for three to four pounds, <laughs> so. They'll be growing the smaller ones. Avalon usually works really well. Atlas is too big. Bugle's okay. Matilda's probably too big. Ultra Butternut and Butternut Supreme are too big. And there's others out there. But, but right now, probably Avalon and Polaris are the two that we're using most common. And I would probably emphasize Polaris a little bit over Avalon because Polaris seems to have black rock tolerance. And black rot's a, a disorder that's caused by the same thing that causes stomach, gummy stem blight. We'll look at it here in a few minutes. But it makes the little brown markings on the fruit. Um, just on the butternut. Just on butternut. No, huh? You get it, gummy stem blight in most other cucurbits just attacks the plant. But on butternut, for some reason, it attacks the fruit. And it makes the fruit have these really cool brown patterns that make it unmarkable. <laughs> They're pretty, they're neat, but they're not marketable. So they're not pretty to the grower. Um, buttercups, we don't grow a lot of anymore. Um, these are kind of like kabokas, I guess you would say. Um, buttercup, amber cup, autumn cup, sweet mama. You know, some are orange, some are green. Um, again, the kabokas we talked about earlier, the um, red ones and the green ones probably are much better, and that's what I'd go with. Uh, with delicatas, typically we use the bush, bush delicata or sweet dumpling. Probably bush delicata is most common. And again, you know, just know that it's going to take a long time to harvest those bunch. <laughs> um, spaghetti. Um, there's a lot of spaghettis out there right now. We have focused a lot with tavoli um, is a nice one. Uh, a new one from Holler I don't have here on the list that we started using more called um, um, pinnacle. So, you know, there are a lot of spaghettis. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, there is no powdery mildew resistance in spaghettis at all. So you need to stay on a tighter spray schedule and uh, stay on a tighter spray schedule with spaghettis for powdery mildew. Um, so between the pinnacle and the spaghetti. They're both fine, whichever one. Honestly, some people like Pinnacle a little better. Some people like Tavoli a little better. I'm fine with either one of them. I probably have recommended Tavoli a little more because it's been around a little longer and Pinnacle's newer. Did you like it? Well, all of them are going to get powdery mildew. You know, we have. You know, the acorns have powdery mildew resistance. Butternuts have, like Avalon and Polaris, have powdery mildew resistance. But when you get into the spaghettis, there's no powdery mildew resistance. I've looked and looked, and I don't find it anywhere. So you just have to spray them. So, you know, for powdery mildew, sulfur is very, very effective. And um, we have some liquid sulfurs like that. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you'll catch it just as soon as it starts, sulfur will stop it in its tracks. Huh? It will. It'll stop it. <laughs> Right, I understand. Um, other specialty winter squash, things like big red warty things, hubbards, kushaws. We have a lot of interest in the mountains in kushaws, the green stripes, the orange stripes, and the tricolor. You know, Lakotas, pink banana, Turks turbans, and the list goes on. Uh, there's all kinds of those out there. And there's, there's 
specialty markets for those. So when we start talking about spacing then, typically uh, cucumbers we space about five foot between rows. Um, we can go tighter. I don't like to go tighter because when you start going in and harvest them, you walk on the vines real bad. So I personally prefer you to trellis cucumbers, put them on five foot between rows and about 12, six to 12 inches in the row. Um, Muskmelon, about two foot in the row on rows five to six foot apart. Watermelon depends on what you're growing. Like if you want big melons, we space them out wider, three to four foot in row, five to six foot between rows. Seedless tend to be a little smaller, so we'll usually tighten the spacing up a little bit in row. And then when you go to palms, they're down to a foot and a half in the row. And so really tight because all we're, we're just trying to get lots of melons about five pounds. So that's what we do. Squash, usually two in, two foot in the row and about five foot between rows. And then that's for summer squash. Winter squash, if it's a bush type plant, five to six foot between rows, two to three foot in row. If it's a more heavy vining variety, we might go out to four or even six foot in row by six foot between rows. So, you know, it depends on, on the winter squash, what kind of a vine you've got. Because if you over plant vining types, you're just wasting seed because they won't set when you get too tight. With pumpkins, traditionally, we've looked at eight foot between rows, four foot in row for about 32 square feet. We had a lot of growers when they first started planting because of their equipment. They take a four row 36 inch John Deere planter and plant the outside two rows. So that made them a nine foot row spacing. And then they plant every three to four foot in the row. So they'd be 27 to 36 feet. As a rule, at what we recommend nowadays is on a bush type plant, about 12 to 18 square feet. On a semi bush, 18, 24, maybe out to 32, but usually 18 to 24. And then on your more prolific binding stuff, about 32 square feet. Like I said, I mentioned some stuff, we'd go up to 60 square feet on something like Cronus. So the extremes that I see, and I've got on here 12 square feet, I actually can take you to growers that are planting on six square feet now. I don't recommend it, they're wasting seed, but you know, 10 to 12 square feet is about as tight as you need to go. And of course, 100 square feet are when you're trying to grow things like um, great big pumpkins and so forth. Um, Again, typically the more equidistant spacing, the better. And the factors that affect our spacing are, again, the plant bigger, how big you want the fruit, your moisture levels, if you've got irrigation or not, equipment, you know, are you going to try to till or mow in the middle, or are you going to use, let the vines vine over real quick, and then what your weed control strategy is. <laughs> this is just a chart that kind of illustrates the kind of plants or seeds you need per acre based on what you know, the spacing we've talked about. So you can see cantaloupe, our cucumbers is around seven to 8,000 seed an acre. Muskmelon, 3,600 to 4,300, usually about 3,630. Seeded melons, you know, 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, palms, you'll be back up to three and 4,000. Summer squash, you know, 3,500 to 4,500. Uh, winter squash from 900 to 2,400, depending on how big it is. And then on pumpkins, you know, we could be at 1360 on something really heavy vining and down as tight as 3630 on something that, that's uh, maybe not real heavy vines. Um, yield, conventionally, these are just kind of some of the yields we might expect. You know, we can get, you know, 600 to 1,000 boxes of cucumbers an acre, and that's, you know, bushel on the ninth. Seven to 10,000 melons, cantaloupes an acre is not unreasonable. Three to five thousand watermelon, summer squash around five or six hundred boxes an acre. Again, that's bush on the nine. And then I've tried to put the winter squash and pumpkins kind of in fruit per acre, so you kind of get an understanding. Five to ten thousand, depending on the fruit type and the variety. Um, on bush type plants and pumpkins, you know, shucks, I've seen some pie pumpkins and some of these little ones that will set ten and fifteen thousand pumpkins an acre. And this is total marketable? Yes, yield. this is marketable yield. I mean, it can be more than that, but this, you can market that many. Yeah. Organically, typically, you know, the yields are a little lower. One, because we usually don't have as much fertility, and a lot of times we grade more things out. And so, you know, keep that in mind that when you start going to organic, you can still produce some good yields, but if you don't have the fertility or you have more damage, you have to grade out. And, Yields are usually about half of what we expect. 
expect from conventional. Let's talk about pollination for a minute. Um, as a rule of thumb, we recommend one hive of honeybees per acre. Um, observations I see in real life, some people have no hives and they didn't have a lot of native bees to do pollination. I have um, seen where there's competition. And you gotta keep in mind, things like muskmelon and cucumbers and watermelon don't have the most attractive flowers in the world to bees. Squash and pumpkins do. Um, but in this part of the world, we have a heavy pollination squash bees, and there are actually native squash bees around here. If you go out at seven o'clock in the morning and look, a lot of times you won't find honeybees, you find squash bees and bumblebees. Um, even though there may be honeybees, but if you have a lot of other things around that are more attractive, like honeysuckle, the, the bees will be working the honeysuckle in the fence row and not out in the, out in the uh, field. So um, one thing we are starting to see a few more growers go to though is using bumblebees. and um, I've had a couple of growers that have been using them and say that they're going to go away completely from honeybees to bumblebees next year uh, for two or three reasons. One is honeybees are not good efficient pollinators. I'm not saying they're not good pollinators, but they it takes several visits from a honeybee to transfer enough pollen to set up root and cucurbits. Whereas a bumblebee is bigger and it can transfer usually enough pollen in one visit to pollinate the fruit. So, or to pollinate the flower and develop the fruit. Another thing is, is obviously, you know, beekeepers are worried about spraying around the fields or possible damage. When you buy, you buy the honeybee, I mean the bumblebees, you're buying the bees, they're yours. Um, they're about 6250 a hive and you have to buy a minimum of four hives, um, which will do about, about four acres. They recommend they recommend two hives an acre on bumblebees, but most people have been using them feel like that a hive and a half an acre is plenty. So, but they come in sets of fours and um, they're 62.50 a hive. And, and then you multiply that times four or four. So that's what, a hundred and about $250 for four hives. But bottom line is they, uh, the bumblebees do their job. And then as the season begins to wear on and they actually burrow into the ground and will become native bees. And you don't, you know, whereas with honeybees, somebody, you know, brings them in, you leave them for six weeks or whatever, and then you take them back out. With the bumblebees, you actually get better pollination, and then they just kind of stay around there. And, you know, the question starts being, how many years can you do that and actually build up a nice native population where you don't even have to bring bees in? So that's just, they're, docile? yeah, they're docile. I mean, if you're aggravating the hive, they're going to sting you. But I mean, they're not like, if you're just out there working, they're, they're not. I mean, the first day after you open the hive up after shipping, I would stay away because they're pretty mad. But after they get settled down, they're fine. And uh, a lot of cucurbit people in the southeast are starting to go to bumblebees. Uh, irrigation. Irrigation is um, really important. Uh, typically, we've grown a lot of our cucurbits with dry land production, but we've seen more and more people going to uh, black plastic and drip on watermelon and musk. Summer squash, um, pumpkins, not as much. Although we are starting to see people like use old strawberry beds and plant pumpkins on them to use their drip, or maybe even I'm seeing more and more people just lay drip irrigation out on top of the bare ground beside the road um, to take care of it. Um, unfortunately, when we overhead irrigate, um, we we can cause a lot of problems, potentially more diseases because we let the foliage. So we try not to overhead irrigate as much as we can keep from it. What we have found is with trickle irrigation, we can increase yields, double and even triple that of non-irrigated. We get increased fruit size. We've seen as large as 25% increase in fruit size. And this is a picture of fusarium fruit rot here. With, with more consistent water, we can sometimes reduce the incidence of fusarium fruit rot. So let's go into disease control for a few minutes. Um, there's a lot of diseases. The first two things I want to discuss are viral and bacteria. We have four viral, common viral diseases, mosaic viruses, and then we have two bacterial diseases, bacterial wilt and yellow vine. All of these are insect vectored, so we, insect control is really important. Here, the four mosaic viruses we have are cucumber mosaic, papaya ring spot, watermelon mosaic, and zucchini yellow mosaic. All of these things look like somebody took a phenoxy herbicide, like 2,4-D2 post to the field, 
you can see the growing points get epinastic. Here you can see really twisted gnarled tissue. In this one, you see this twisted tissue, but you also see the green color and the discoloration that papaya causes. And these all, they're really hard to differentiate by looking at them. You almost have to send them to a lab to get an ID which one you have. Uh, this is watermelon mosaic, and you can see the green and the winter squash. Here's zucchini yellow and pumpkins and, and zucchini, and you can see the wartiness it causes. And You know, if you're retailing pumpkins, people will buy those warty ones first. But when you're shipping them to a chain store, you'll get them rejected. <laughs> so obviously that's not a good thing. Um, and here's how bad zucchini yellow can get. Um, and this was a situation several years ago, not far from where we're sitting right now, of a grower that had grown squash early, right beside it had grown cucumbers, and then came right back and did squash again right beside it in the fall. And the aphid population was terrible. And you had a hard time finding fruit in that field that did not have virus in it. It was just the whole field was eat up with it. And it wasn't real severe yet, but you can see the green striping and the green discoloration in the fruit. And it was really hard to find fruit that wasn't affected. As a matter of fact, he had to just destroy the whole thing. And it's hard to throw away an acre of squash you've worked on. So viral disease control is transmitted by aphids. Um, and the, it's really hard to prevent anything by chemical because it only takes just a few seconds of feeding for um, the aphid to transmit, transmit the virus. So if it's feed, fed on something and has it on its feeding tube and it goes to a healthy plant and feeds, it pretty much infects that plant. So you have to have something really quick. We do see that if you use like a neonicotinoid insecticide or a seed treatment, um, that it does help like admire platinum and venom, but it's not 100% control. Other things that we have are things like um, yellow mulch repels aphids, but remember yellow attracts cucumber beetles. So you don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, and also yellow mulch delays maturity. But then we have some insecticides like Lanate, Fulfill, um, Closer now, um, Savanto. There's several things out there that's labeled uh, belief that we can use that are really good and are really relatively safe on beneficial. Lanate's not, I know, but Fulfill and Belief and, and um, Closer are pretty safe. And then we have resistant varieties, and I mentioned earlier things like Magician and Kratos that actually have resistance to zucchini yellow mosaic virus. Uh, bacterial will is transmitted by cucumber beetles. And if you want to know if you have bacterial will or not, grow a few straight eight cucumbers and you will find out. Straight eight is the most sensitive variety there is. And so um, very common, um, you'll see part of the vines just go down. And then this is called yellow vine. It's actually called now cucurbit yellow vine decline. Um, it's been around since the late 80s or early 80s. Um, it's transmitted by squash bugs. So we have to be careful with that. So bacterial wilt and yellow vine control, opposite of viral transmission where the aphid feeds and infects. The cucumber beetle has to choose for, chew for a few minutes. And so um, if you have a neonicotinoid or some sort of systemic insecticide out there, it works really well. Same thing with squash bugs. If you have um, a neonicotinoid, that squash bug or cucumber beetle, it has to chew for a few minutes. So they're very effective. And this is just some old, old data from Kentucky about using admire back when it first came out. And basically, they took some cantaloupe plants, treated them with admire at 24, 16, and 8 fluid ounces an acre along with an untreated check. And you can see here that for so 23 days after treating, you know, 17, there was still essentially no cucumber beetles in the treatment. And you can see that up to 30 beetles on five leaves. So they were getting six beetles per leaf and five beetles per leaf at 17 and 23 days. You can also see the progression of bacterial will that, you know, at 39 days, there was almost no bacterial will. But then you start to see the rate response. The higher the rate, the better the control. And of course, the untreated check by day 61 had like 72% of the plants had bacterial wilt. So here's where the rubber really hits the road is you see that, you know, where you use 24 ounces an acre, they harvested 10,000 marketable millions per acre. At 16 ounces, about 9,000. At 8 ounces, a little over 6,000. Down about 1,700 where they had nothing. 
So in those days, that highest treatment was about $120 an acre. The medium treatment was like $75 an acre. And the low treatment was, you know, I don't know, somewhere 50, 60 bucks an acre. So you can see there that even though it wasn't, you know, it didn't, t the melons more than paid for the fun insecticide treatment. Um, some other common cucurbit diseases, anthracnose. This is what anthracnose looks like on watermelon. Um, you can see it on the fruit, very spotty. Um, there are some resistant varieties, but there are multiple strains of anthracnose now, so a good spray program is important. This is downy mildew and muskmelon, and it can be dev very devastating in muskmelon and, and cucumbers. Um, this is what downy mildew looks like in pumpkins. Sometimes can be just confused with other nutritional things. But if you'll ever look, turn the leaf over, you'll see a brownish tan lesion and growth on the backside if it's downy mildew. And there are new strains of downy mildew that um, at least a strain. And you can go to this website and look at the forecast to see where it's moving and where it's at for the year. Um, new products, um, things like Presidio, Previcure, Ranman, Revis, Tanos. Rotation is very, very important. Um, using things like uh, chlorothalamin and mancozeb and tank mixes. And then organically, you're looking at typically Sonata. Uh, you can put, um, possibly put uh, regalia with that, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, there is a brand new fungicide that I don't think I got on this list called Orondus, and there are three formulations of it, Orondus Opti, O-P-T-I, Orondus Gold, and Orondus Ultra. And Orondus Ultra is actually a tank mix, a premix of Orondus and Revis, and it is excellent on downy mildew. It's probably the next, the best fungicide we have now. Earlier I mentioned the organism that causes gummy stem blight. This is what gummy stem looks like. Gummy stem blight looks like on the foliage, but on the fruit, like I said, I didn't put a picture in, but it makes a brown discoloration on butternut. Uh, this is microdochium or plectosporium blight. You can see the diamond-shaped lesions. This is a rotational disease, like I mentioned earlier. If you don't rotate, this disease is going to be worse. So you really have to do a good job on a rotation and a good job with spray program. And unfortunately, organically, there is nothing that controls this organism. Nothing <laughs> um, whatsoever. This is Fusarium fruit rot. There are at least 11 different species of Fusarium that affect pumpkins. Um, what we really find the most manifestation with Fusarium is that it appears after periods of stress, if it's been hot and dry, or sometimes wet, but it's usually hot and dry, the pumpkin or the fruit isn't as, um, as um, I won't say healthy, doesn't have as tough a skin. And so there's always Fusarium in the soil, and so if that fruit isn't as healthy as it can be, sometimes it attacks that fruit. So things that we try to do to control fusarium or irrigation, uh, using maybe possibly calcium nitrate to side dress with, foliar applications of calcium, anything to try to keep that plant healthier. And again, rotation. We've looked in the past at looking uh, like no-till or minimum till, and actually I've seen it worse than no-till because if it stresses because it doesn't have enough moisture, then there's grass actually is an alternate host for fusarium. Dying grass has fusarium on it. So it can actually make it worse. So no-till doesn't always help. This is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew looks like somebody sprinkled baby powder on the plant. Um, honestly, there's some resistance issues out there, but this right here illustrates, like with Cabrio, we've got a lot of resistance, but sulfur, I mentioned earlier, is very, very effective in controlling powdery mildew. We did a lot of work several years ago with different fungicides. And real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I will just point out that that is the organic formulation of sulfur at the time. And you can see we applied it when we had like about 10, 8 to 10 percent infection. It got as bad as 20, and that was it. It stopped it. Very, very effective. Sonata doesn't have activity on powdery. It's strictly a omycete fungicide. Storox, which is similar to um, oxidate, it's a hydrogen peroxide. It works, but you've really got to be on your guard. As soon as you see infection, you've got to apply it. One I was a little more excited about as far as biologicals is Green Cure, which is a potassium bicarbonate. 
Green Pure, this was actually just a 1% rate. If you would take Green Pure up to a 2% rate, I believe we would have seen a little bit better activity. Um, potassium bicarbonate is usually pretty effective on, on powdery mildew. But again, as soon as you see infection, you have to treat. Because once that kind of gets established, it's harder to kill. So as soon as you see infection, within the first 24 to 48 hours, it does much better. But like I said, sulfur is organic and it's very easy. The only thing you got to be careful with with sulfur is sulfur applications when it's above 90 degrees can cause some foliar burn. So if it's over 90 degrees, don't apply sulfur. And then over here on the right, you can see the conventional products like Bravo, Nova, Pristine, Tano's Bravo, Nova, Pristine. And you can see that we got excellent activity out of those products. I also did another study in 2010. And thing about this <clears throat> shows that a lot of these products work, but the thing that always got my attention was how good resistance varieties are in controlling powdery mildew. And you can see here on the left bar, it says untreated check, UTC. The brown bar is the gold challenger, which doesn't have a very strong powdery mildew package. And the blue bar is gladiator. We only had 20% infection in the untreated check with the gladiator. So resistant varieties in pumpkins and winter squash are by far the way to go. I mean, you can see here, we probably wouldn't even have had yield loss or quality loss if we hadn't sprayed it off. I mean, and even our fungicides, we were just holding it around 10%. But, you know, it made a lot more difference on non-powdery mildew resistant varieties. Uh, this was yield, not a lot of difference. As a matter of fact, the yields were very good from, you know, from the uh, gladiator all the way across. Uh, Phytophthora capsissi, this is a serious one. If you do have Phytophthora, pumpkins are very sensitive to it, as are some winter squash um, and summer squash. There's no such thing as control. Uh, it persists in the soil. Some people feel eight years. We know at least three or four or five years. And if you have alternate host plants in the field, as long as you've got alternate host and it has a food supply, it's going to stay there. Um, it has a resting spore that can stay in the soil for a while. But, you know, all cucurbits are alternate hosts. All solanaceous crops like potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, uh, tobacco are alternate hosts. And peppers, of course, being the most sensitive. And now we even find that green beans can live on the roots and actually affect them now. There are a root phase, there's a plant phase, there's a fruit and foliage phase. And so we do things like try to avoid fields that we now have it, avoid planting in lower wet areas. Uh, fungicides, we can use things like uh, Ritamil, uh, Ritamil Gold Bravo to the foliage, Presidio, Tanos, and I mentioned earlier the Orondus Gold is more specific for Phytophthora. So this is kind of just some list of fungicides that we have that control the different diseases. So the ones here would control downy mildew, and I would add obviously Orondus onto that list. Gummy stem blight, things like uh, Bravo or Chlorothalonil, Polycure, Inspire, Super, Pristine. And then when we go to Microdotium, uh, Chlorothalonil, Cabrio, Diphane, Inspire, Super, Maneb, Pristine, and possibly Quadris. Um, and then Powdery Mildew, a whole list of things there. Uh, wettable Sulfur for Organic. Serenade has some, uh, some activity preventatively. And then uh, Quintec has a label for only millions and pumpkins. Now the strongest one, I don't even have on there, and I keep forgetting to add it to this list, and that is a product called Torino. It's conventional, but Torino right now is the best powdery mildew product for cucurbits. T-O-R-I-N-A, Torino. How do you spell the car? Torino. R-I-N-O. Yep. I always want to put an A on the end, but it's T-O-R-I-N-O. It's 3.4 fluid ounces an acre, and you need to use a surfactant with it. But it's excellent. It'll control powdery mildew. I knew you'd know that. So I bring up right quick regalia. Regalia is a, a newer fungicide. It's a knotweed extract. It's organic certified, or OMRI certified. Um, on the label, you'll see powdery mildew, anthracnose, alternaria, circospora leaf spot, downy mildew, gummy strand blight, phytophthora. It it is a protectant. It's something that you know you're not going to just go out there and have a real bad problem and spray it and expect to cure it. Um, one to four quarts per acre, applied every seven days, 25 to 100 gallons an acre. If you have downy mildew, tank mix it with Sonata, and if you have Phytophthora, tank mix with Sonata rotated with copper. Again, this isn't a standalone, you know, silver bullet, but organically it's a product that, that helps. 
Although honestly, the coppers and the sulfurs are probably their best function, uh, you know, as a rule on our on our uh, organic disease control. And then through the drip, you also get some activity on on soil pathogens like fusarium, phytophthora, pythium, rhizoctonium, and verticillium. The same rate, one to two, one to four quarts an acre, starting at transplanting and repeat every 14 days. Uh, real quick, I mentioned Bravo and Sunburn. Uh, we always recommend when you start to get mature watermelon, you quit using Bravo because it causes sunburn. Well, we think the same thing happens in pumpkins. So in the fall of the year, when you start to see a lot of orange fruit, don't spray Bravo anymore uh, to minimize sunburn. And then, of course, on pumpkin stem quality is very, very important. We basically, you know, want to control our diseases like powdery mildew and plectosporium blight because they affect the stem. But this picture right here just shows an example. The pumpkin on the left, and I know these aren't the prettiest pumpkins, they're little pumpkins that were grown on bare ground, so they're kind of dirty, but it had a good spray program. The one in the middle was kind of a biological spray program, the biopesticide type, and the one on the right was untreated. And you can definitely see differences in stem quality by the pesticides. So vine health is very important, irrigation, fertility, et cetera, and keeping those vines healthy. Um, I do want to bring out something else, though, that we really found back in that study in 2010 was there's also a correlation to the percentage of bad stems to vine health. The healthier you keep the vine, the fewer bad stems you have. And so if you can keep that vine alive and healthy until you harvest it, you'll have no bad stems. But if the vines are starting to decline and you, when you go to harvest, you'll start to see some. And if you've had a lot of vines die, it'll get worse. So. Keeping those stems healthy, you know, keeping the vines healthy really helps you keep good stems. Um, again, for pumpkins, we want dark green or almost black stems that are really hard, that are cured out, free of disease. And um, if you cut immature stems, they will shrivel or rot. Um, and you, you know, if that happens, you can get your pumpkins rejected. Let's spend a few minutes about insect control. We're going to look at some pictures, but typically for aphids, we have our neonicotinoids, we have admired platinum. Foliarly, we have things like capture and malathion. But capture, you have to really crank the rate up. For cucumber beetles, through squash, mine borers, basically pyrethroids. Um, we do have in trust now, um, you know, that is OMRI certified. I'll be honest, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, we do have seven in malathion in that list. And then for spider mites, things like Agrimex, Anatol, Kelthane, and I think there's a few new ones labeled now um, for miticides. If you're really interested, we can dig that out. Uh, this is a picture of aphids, and I've already mentioned aphids transmit viruses, so we really want to try to minimize aphids. And they blow up really quick, so you can get populations. We try to minimize the applications of pyrethroids or pyganic because they tend to kill off the beneficials and will flare the aphids. Uh, cucumber beetles, this is a striped one. There's also a spotted one in here. You can see the larva in the soil. Um, they transmit the bacterial wilt. Again, however, the, the neonicotinoids have activity on it, but then also pyganic, neem, et cetera. Uh, we did, for sometimes we get into these issues where we can't find treated seed. And so occasionally we'll make our own seed treatment and um, use an admirer or uh, heirlooms and stuff like that. And basically, what we try to do is to put the right dosage by using about five cc's of admirer per thousand seed. And we shake it up in a bag, let it dry with a little bit of water so we coat everything good and it works really well. Uh, then we usually spread it out on a, on a screen or something to dry. And this will give you three to four weeks control of aphids, cucumber beetles, and squash bugs. However, now we don't have to worry about that much um, because Syngenta actually makes a seed treatment that has thiomethoxam in it along with three fungicides. And it works really, really well on early season disease control and insect control. So uh, with the far more, I think they call it FI-400 now, it used to be DI-400. But basically um, it gives you about three to four weeks worth of cucumber beetle activity, squash bug activity, aphid activity, and it helps with early seedling diseases. And so here again, um, this is just far more DI-400, has Dynasty Apron and Maxim as a fungicide, and then Thiomethoxan. And like I said, it's, it's very, very effective, and it's not very expensive. 
One other insecticide I'll mention briefly for organic growers. This is not, it's not a silver bullet, but it's actually being used by some conventional growers in Florida because it has a short pre-harvest interval and gets close to harvest, they can use it. Um, it's very effective on worms at one to three pounds an acre. Uh, and then if you, you can get some activity out of it on aphids, mites, thrip, and white flies, they use in the higher rates. Again, it's not a silver bullet, but it's not bad. It's one of the few things that you have that have organically that you can use for aphid, mite, thrip, and, and white flies. These are just some other worms that sometimes can be a problem. They're not usually issues, but they, they can be problems at times. Here's the squash bug that transmits yellow vine, and you can see here, these are all nymph stages. Um, you see the eggs there in the nice little neat rows, and then the nymphs are attached out. And then on the fruit there, on the bottom of the Turks turban, you'll see a, a gray one. That's still a nymph stage. And then uh, the adults come out in the spring and, and lay more eggs, and you get to bite it again. Squash vine borer is not usually a problem in commercial production. However, we've kind of seen it resurge because of not having to spray for the first three or four weeks because you use a neonicotinoid insecticide. And about the time that insecticide is starting to run out, and which it doesn't have activity on this organism, this, this species, um, you'll start to get flights of squash vine borers. So sometimes we may need to think about using a pyrethroid or a pyganic application about three or four weeks after planting to ensure that you control squash vine borer and then, but don't do a lot of that because we're not trying, we don't want to flare aphids and mites. And here's the two-spotted spider mite, which typically isn't too bad in cucurbits, although it can get in cucumbers real bad. It can get in all of them, but cucumbers are probably the most susceptible. So we'll spend a minute now on weed control. And this is where it gets a lot harder, especially organic. Um, if you're organic, there's not a lot that we're talking about you can use uh, plastic and using the uh, mowing the middles. Uh, we are having some people now that are using the axe and with pretty good success, um, which is basically a complete vegetation control. Um, and of course, you can do flaming, um, mulching, you know, those sorts of things are pretty much what you're limited to. Again, cultivation, hoe, flaming no-till, strip-till, <laughs> but when you're working with things that that vine, you have to get it done before the vines go out, so and that gets to be a challenge. Mulching is probably your best option then, if you can either do something like a no-till residue or put straw down in the middle to minimize weed, that gets expensive. Uh, for plastic culture, again, you can do cultivation to a point, um, seed ryegrass and mow it, and then of course the burn downs with the things like acetic acid match, and now the axe and flaming. Um, I won't spend a lot of time with these, I'm just basically with muskmelon, you have AIM, paraquat or glyphosate for a burn down. Pre-emergence, I know Alanap's not really available anymore if you still have existing supplies. A lot of people use strategy um, because it does have a, a mix of command and curb it, and it does a pretty good job except for tough control broadleaf weeds. Uh, Post-emergence, basically your grass herbicides like select and post. However, you can go across the top of sandia, and sandia is very good on uh, pigweed, cuckleburr, et cetera, if you catch them small. And so it's very safe in muskmelon and cucumbers. And then post-directed to the middle, you can do aim or glyphosate to control um, uh, escaped weeds. And always be careful with Roundup, because if you get glyphosate on the plant, it can damage the plant pretty bad. It's systemic. And then once you have clean middles again, you can actually put something like Treplan in the middle to control. Cucumbers, again, uh, AIM, paraquat, glyphosate. Be careful though, um, direct seeding where you've sprayed AIM, it has a little bit of soil activity. On plastic, it's fine, but um, if you're out on bare ground, don't plant into it. Um, okay. The, um, do we want to address that now or do we want to? Go back. Okay, I'm sorry. We just got a message just came through about marking the fungicides that are organic or make a separate slide. Well, I tried to, and I may have forgot it. Basically, regalia and sonata and serenade, and then copper and sulfur are the only three, only, I guess, five products we have. Well, there's other things out there 
there's double nickel, there's actinovate, um, but probably Sonata and Serenade and then the sulfur and copper get used the most. And then like I say, and so if we need to, we can maybe do something different down the road. Um, okay, let me go back there if I went too far. Okay, um, cucumbers, very similar. A lot of times people will use Sandia or Strategy pre-emergence or something like um, Sandia post-emergence. Again, in cantaloupes and cucumbers, uh, they're very tolerant to Sandia, um, where some of the others are not. And then, of course, post or select for grass control. And then again, the AIM, Treplan, and glyphosate for the middles. Pumpkins. Uh, we do have dual labeled um, that we can use, and um, you have curvent strategy, etc. Not a lot different. Um, post emergence, we have Sandia with post and select. Now in Virginia, we have a section 24C, and I'm probably going to come up on it in a minute for reflex pre emergence, but we can't use that in. Um, I don't know. I don't think Kentucky has a label, and I don't know about West Virginia. Um, Again, we can use AIM, glyphosate, sandia, and treplan in row mills. Summer squash, the same burn downs. And then again, something like maybe sandia or strategy or a combination of the two pre emergence. And then again, sandia. You have to be careful with sandia post emergence in, in uh, uh, pumpkins and squash. They're pretty tolerant, but the bottom line is. Sandia needs to be put out post-emergence between the three and five leaf stage. If you put it out too early, it can kill a plant. <coughs> if you put it out too late, it will really mess up the fruit development. So I have people that wait and spray it like seven leaves, it really dings it up. So we try to put it out between three and five leaves so the plant has time to recoup before it starts to set fruit. And then again, the product that can go in the row middles like aim, curbit, Glyphosate, Sandia, and Trepa. Watermelon, the same burn down. It has a few more products, but honestly, in our part of the world, two to four ounces of sin bar aren't going to do anything. So we're still probably going to stay with things like Strategy and, and, and Sandia. But now, we have to be careful here with Sandia because it's very injurious to watermelon. You can put a little bit out pre emergence, but do not spray it over the top of a watermelon. It will kill it. Um, this is another, we have reflex labeled for watermelon, and it's very safe in watermelon. That's kind of weird. Sandia is safe in cucumbers and cantaloupes and things up watermelon. Reflex is safe in pumpkins, watermelon, and somewhat in squash, but it slays cantaloupe and water and cucumbers. <laughs> so we'll spend a little time on that in just a minute. Post emergence, we still have our post and, and select max. And then our AIM, Sandia, Treflin, and Glyphosate for row noodles. Winter squash. Um, winter squash is a little tougher sometimes than pumpkins. They take things a little better. Uh, we can go with higher rates of command. Uh, most people would still probably use something like Sandia and Strategy. And I put a question mark beside Sandia here because some species are a little bit more specific, you know, and, um, you know a little bit more sensitive. Um, and another thing is, is you have to be careful with some of the winter squash on curvet. Curvet can really ding up some things like um, um, some of the winter squash, so be careful with it. Um, Post-emergence, again, I caution you with the sandia. Just be careful and kind of learn how your variety responds to uh, the sandia damage. I mentioned dual and, and reflex a while ago. Uh, dual magnum is labeled for squash and pumpkins. It's considered kind of a row middle treatment, not supposed to be applied over the top of seed or young plants. And that's what the label says, unfortunately, most are not, not unfortunately, but most people have already been using it right over the top of everything for the last 20 years. So um, again, um, it is labeled, just be careful with it. What we have always found with, mag with dual magnum is that if you put it out after you seed, we have way less injury than you do if you put it out before you seed. If you spray it and then plant through that and move a little bit of the herbicide down into the seed zone, um, you'll get more damage. Um, Reflex has a tolerance now in Virginia, North Carolina, and like I said, I know, I'm pretty sure Kentucky doesn't have it. Um, it is labeled. And we're looking at about, I think Virginia, we get to use 16 to 24 ounces an acre, and it's pre-emergence in pumpkins and watermelon. 
It's not any of the other cucurbits. Um, here's a couple other herbicides we've looked at through the years, and chances are we will never get them in this part of the world, although Georgia gets to use Valor because they have a third party registration. And FMC is probably not going to go forward with Spartan because there's just too much issue of injury if you're not careful. Uh, real quick, decorative items. I won't spend a lot of time here, but you know, winter squash offer both culinary options and color for fall sales. People who are retailing and even now wholesaling, we're doing mixed bins of, of winter squashes and gourds. Uh, you know, gourds are obviously expanding and ex and uh, expand our decorative markets. And then, of course, throwing things like corn stalks and Indian corn in there help also. And this is just some pictures of some of the different ornamentals, some Indian corn, some squash, some gourds, some swan gourds, some turk turbans in the back of that lower picture, and then things like the apple gourd down in the lower right-hand side. Uh, this was a fellow here in southwest Virginia he used to do a waxing gourd. He would grow them, and he'd wash them, and then he'd put acrylic full wax on them and then bag them. And actually had a pretty good market for a while, really did a good job. Um, ornamental gourds, we grow things like small fruited autumn wings, nest egg, um, or orange, pear bicolor, chenot crown of thorns, small flat striped, um, spoons, boarded. There's all kinds of things out there now. Um, and and the, there's some really neat things. And then larger things like the apples, the birdhouse, caveman's club, dippers, snakes, swans, um, so forth. So I thank you all for your attention, and I thank uh, people that help us do our research, the seed companies that get us our seeds so that we can look at these trials every year, and, and their help in harvesting plots. And, and again, thank you all for, for your time tonight. And I guess at that, we'll open it up if there's any more uh, questions you all want answered. All right, I guess none. <laughs>
sure. there have been a lot of discussions of trap crops mm -hmm. and one of the common ones that has been used is like the Hubbard squash. Mm -hmm. I think Blue Hubbard has been one um, that people can plant around the field and possibly trap. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know that the that the insects really like the Blue Hubbard any more than they do the other squash. Okay. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, yes, there's a really strong trap crop. Um, like I said, there's been some research along that line and I haven't really seen anything definitive. And you know, and of course, there's a lot of work now being done with farmscaping and so forth. And you know, unfortunately, some of the recent stuff on farmscaping has showed that yes, it brings in more beneficials, but sometimes it also builds populations of the mm -hmm. unwanted insects. And so you kind of have to balance. Right. Okay. Um, The best crop rotation, what's the best crop rotation for winter squash? Um, I don't know that you would have an ideal crop rotation, but um, I know like with pumpkins a lot of times we do things like a brassica crop and, and a uh, corn or something like that or a legume, trying to get away from cucurbits for at least two or three years so that we can try to, to break up the insect and disease cycle. Plus the other thing is, is you know, in conventional, we have really good weed control in things like sweet corn, and so we can kind of control the weeds in those off years and then come back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of anything that breaks it up. But the other thing is, you kind of look at is what's your fertility too. You know, a lot of times some of these other crops we might put a lot of fertilizer out there for a tomato or for a sweet corn or something, and then the pumpkins can kind of benefit from that leftover fertilizer mm -hmm. or winter squash. Do we have any other questions out there before we wrap up? All right. Well, it looks like people are starting to sign off. So if you guys have any other questions after the fact, um, Dr. Straw's email is down below, and we'll make sure that this is available um, later on in case you need to refer back to it at any point. Thanks so much for everybody coming out today. I really appreciate it. Take care. Oh.